I'm Noel Latif, uh, President of the Foreign Policy Association. I'm delighted to welcome you to this lecture this evening. Uh, if you've been wondering where the U.S. economy is heading, you've come to the right place. Uh, Beth Ann Bovino has been recognized by the Wall Street Journal as one of the most accurate forecasters of the U.S. economy. She is the chief U.S. economist with S&P Global Ratings Services. She holds degrees from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, Yale University, and Columbia University. I am delighted to invite Beth Ann to deliver the Peter G. Peterson Lecture on National Security and Fiscal Policy. Beth Ann Bovino. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nolan, and thanks for having me. I had done something with um, the Foreign Policy Group, uh, I guess about a year ago, so now it's, I guess it's becoming an annual thing. <laughs> uh, so where are we? And I, I also like, um, I heard that this crowd likes to, uh, likes to discuss things, uh, so I certainly encourage that. I think that would be a great, it kind of keeps things alive. Uh, on where we, you know, just the discussion, what, ha what to hear people's feedback, I think is certainly something that I would, I would uh, love to see. Um, why don't I do a couple of slides? I'll do uh, several slides. We can take a little bit of a, you know, break and see if there's any thoughts or comments from you, and then we can, you know, I can do a few more. So, like any economist, uh, generally we have the good news and the bad news, and I usually like to start with the good news. You know, keep people a little bit, you know, happy until then we sink into the abyss. I guess you could say for economists that goes. Now, it's not that bad. But um, I guess, uh, let's see where we are. Now, it's the oldest expansion in history. Um, I guess we can say there are reasons to celebrate. Uh, it's now over 10 years since the world fell into the Great Recession, uh, and so far so good for the U.S. We're also, the U.S. Ex um, expansion is still, is now the oldest in U.S. history, too. So that's kind of neat. Unfortunately, it's also the slowest. Um, you, uh, if you look at the growth rate that we've seen in the last 10 years of this recovery, it's been growing at about, about two and a quarter. Uh, historically, if you go back, back to the 50s, usually expansions, the growth pace would be closer to four and a half. So when I, um, a lot of times we come up with titles, and I had this great title called Half Fast Recovery. Say it three times and you'll understand. You gotta say it fast, you'll understand why. And I think it actually was very apt, although I was encouraged not to use this. Might offend some people with a sensitive ears, I guess. So we didn't, but we also, but we did call it half fast, I'm sorry, half, half speed recovery, kind of a little bit less. And that also makes the case. Why was it so slow? Uh, and it wasn't just for the US. I um, mean, the US indeed, we saw slow, slow recovery across the, across the world in many places with some falling back in recession. Why was this? It was tied to the financial crises. And what we found historically, some of the studies that have been done, is that historically when you go through a financial crisis of what the U.S. and many of our major, major trading partners go through, well, first, you see a recession. Check, we saw a severe recession. Second, we see many years of slow growth, which in the United States we saw. And some go back into recession. Look at Greece. Look at some parts of the EU. Uh, and third, it takes unemployment rates years to recover, and some not at all. Now, this was not something that I came up, came up with. It, I'm really pulling from that famous book, This Time It's Different. This was their thesis, and indeed it held true. But with that said, I do want to focus on some good news. We can go to even more bad news later, but let's focus on the good news first. The U.S. today, at this point in time, is still rather resilient. If you look at what you see in front of you, um, confidence still holding up relatively well, at least for households. Business confidence, maybe not so much. But household confidence is still rather strong. And they're spending. Uh, they're opening up their checkbooks, and it's helped by uh, higher wages. Businesses, while we're seeing them slow in terms of um, investment activity, they are still hiring, giving consumers reason to spend as well. Uh, housing has been stable. That's a positive. We were very concerned about that, and that looks like that's stabilized in a positive way. And of course, 
Uh, ret manufacturing, which is struggling at this point in time, we do think the long-term trends for manufacturing are holding up relatively well. I'd also like to add another positive for the U.S. economy at this point in time. Markets seem to have stabilized. That was a, certainly a concern and one of the reasons why the Fed had moved into its, its, um, its uh, three insurance cuts. We think that was one factor. That movement by the Fed likely stabilized markets and it also added bonus. It also stabilized the housing market as well. We're looking for real GDP likely to kind of slow this year to at about 2.3%. Last year it was 3%. And next year, it's going to go to trend growth. Now, trend growth is a lot slower than what we had hoped, looking like it's under 2 at maybe 1.7 or 1.8. I have some slides on that later. But at least it's in positive territory, so we have that going for us. Now, uh, what's the, why are things holding up relatively well? As, uh, despite all the headline news about the, uh, particularly what's happening overseas, um, it's the domestic side. It's still robust. And why is that? Because it's all about jobs. If you look at this chart, if you look at this chart, jobs are, have been incredibly strong. Last year and the year before, the average monthly job gains was about 200,000 on, on average last year and the year before, or even higher. This year it has slowed, but keep in mind, the unemployment rate is what, 3.6, I think it is? That is incredibly low. So what we would say that the U.S. is kind of gliding into what we could what could would considered to be near or at full employment. The, the bars are job gains, and you can see how strong they are. That, that dark maroon line on the bottom, that's wages. And what we're also seeing, not only we are seeing stronger jobs, a stronger jobs market, we are also seeing more jobs at higher wages. That gives people reason to spend. Now, that top line up there, that red line, that's job openings. One thing that we noticed there is if you can see, um, it was at near record, at record or near record highs for a good amount of time. One worry that we had is that, and we still think this is a concern for the U.S., is the so-called skills gap. Gap. We do think that, and businesses complain about this, that businesses businesses uh, say they can't find the workers that they need for with the with the needed skills. We do think this is a problem, but um, but we think that there are other factors that explain why their job openings are so high. Something I found when I spoke with some people who are involved in retail, re the retail sector, what they're finding, and those would be more lower, lower paying jobs, less skilled jobs that in the re in, often in the retail sector, they're also struggling to find, uh, to find workers as well. So I think the job openings um, story, aside from the skills gap, it also just goes to show how tight the jobs market is. So that, and what that means, that means that there's more money to spend. When you see, have more money, more jobs at higher wages, you have more money to spend. This has helped stabilize. People are buying big ticket items like cars and homes. And we're seeing in this reading, this is looking at housing starts in the blue line and multifamily. So housing starts, that will be single family homes. And the red line is multifamily starts. The good news here is first, we're seeing it stabilize. There was a concern that we were going to start to see it get weaker and weaker. And that, for the U.S. economy, would be not be a very good thing. The other news is that it's not going up because the other worry on the flip side is worry about a bubble. It looks like house, um, housing prices have stabilized and we're seeing a little bit of a bubble, a little, little bit of the air coming out of prices and that's a positive. We think what's stabilized, what's helping it, helping it stabilize is the Fed cushion um, actually helps add some support as well as, as well as people having more money to spend. And for those you, for the, you mom and dads out there, that stock price, those, those higher stock, uh, the higher stock market also means that mom and dad has down payment for their kids to get out of their basement. So that's also something that we're seeing to keep it stable. Now, another thing that we saw as a positive for the U.S. economy was that the yield curve has reverted, um, inverted, um, I'm sorry, it was inverted and now it's back in positive territory. If you can kind of see over here, um, that little blip, it was inverted. Uh, the yield curve was inverted for about five months. Now, a lot of, there is a debate about whether the yield curve has its predictive power, the signal of a recession. It is debated not just by us at, as economists, but it's also debated by the Fed. There's two, there's, cam there's two camps at the Fed. One say it still has a signal predictive power. Others say, well, it doesn't work anymore because we have such a large global market or because central banks have got into um, quantitative easing, which has distorted the curve. 
Now, my opi my opinion is this is well, one, it still hurts the banks when you have an when you have an inverted curve, and second. Uh, you know, I would argue that markets would, uh, would, you know, if they want to ignore it, they're ignoring it at their own risk. When you look at the history of its success in terms of signaling, um, signaling recessions going forward. Now, the yield curve is now in positive territory after whole, being in an inverted for five months. There's a couple reasons why, you know, a couple, couple arguments about why it's now in positive territory. One, maybe the Fed's uh, insurance cuts save the day. They stabilized markets. They gave a little bit of cushion for for businesses and also for um, for households in terms of borrowing a, bar, a little bit of a borrowing boost to save the day, so that the expansion can then go smooth sailing for a little while longer. Another reason that's been kind of um, talked about about why. Um, why it inverted in the first place, and why it's in positive territory. There's um, the federal, the uh, the Fed um, kind of tries to estimate what is the so-called neutral rate for the federal funds rate. Nobody knows what it is. You, they're make, so they're making, in a sense, a guesstimate of what they think the neutral rate is uh, for the federal funds rate. And the neutral rate mean it, the neutral rate for the federal funds rate is when the Fed thinks that it's at just the place where it's not too hot not too cold. It's just right. It's the Goldilocks for the new, for the federal funds rate. Well, they, they, you know, the argument has been said that maybe the Fed um, estimate for the neutral rate was too high and markets reaction let them know. So that's why they cut rates three times, bringing it down to what could be considered to be what was the so-called right estimate for the neutral rate. The third reason for the federal, um, for uh, the yield curve, um, the yield curve inversion and then going into positive territory is that, you know, the signal's still active. It's not necessarily that a recession is no longer a possibility. It's not, it's not that at all. What it says is that if, it, if there is a recession, if the, if the signal is correct and there is a recession, it's going to be short. If you look at all the, the pre, those bars are, are, recess, are recessions, and you can see, you can kind of see that it inverted, it inverted, it inverted, it inverted, it inverted, but it didn't stay down there. It didn't stay there all the way up until the recession. So you can see it going back to ter uh, positive territory well before a recession starts. One thing that people have said, although it's not a, a, it's not a real strong signal, but some say that if it doesn't, it, but if it, go, if it goes back to um, positive territory, it could signal that if there is a recession, it'll be a short one. Now, um, that's the good news. Let's go to the, to the, actually, I can stop and see if there's any comments or thoughts. Now, I'm going to go to the negative stuff, but if you have any positive stuff to say, say it now. <laughs> Anything? What's that? Could you just uh, elaborate a little more on the uh, manufacturing uh, positive trend that you saw and what sectors of manufacturing? Yeah, that's a long term. Yeah, that's a long term trend. I should change that. <laughs> um, in terms of manufacturing, on the long run, um, what we have found, and and this is going to be a long term trend. What we had seen is that, and this is going back from you know what we what we noticed going back several years, even in 2012. One thing that we noticed in manufacturing uh, was that manufacturing. Um, I, I'm going to date myself in terms of my age. I was one of those kids It was told, like, you know, buy American, buy American, buy American, but nobody did. Manufacturing was crushed. Uh, and when you look in terms of the jobs lost in manufacturing from the 1960s, um, 1960s jobs in manufacturing made up, I think in the 60s it was close to 30% at one time of overall jobs because we were a manufacturing society. It's changed. Now it only barely makes, it's in the single digit. Maybe it's 6%, maybe it's 7%. But manufacturing over that period, except for some ups and downs, had actually done relatively well in terms of production. We think a lot of that factor, what, what factored that into that over the long run was because basically of technological changes that manufacturing made to improve their productivity gains. So that would be a long-term trend that we've seen in manufacturing. In fact, manufacturing got out of the recession, the financial crisis and recession, long before other parts of other sectors did. That's what I was talking about in terms of some of the innovative uh, moves that manufacturing had done earlier on suggest that they have a long, they have long-term gains going forward. But in the short term, where we are right now with what's happening with the trade dispute and other factors, they've got lots of problems. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So is long-term 10 years or 
I would say a lot, yeah, you could go out 10 years, 10 years for, for, for manufacturing, yes. Um, I live part of the year overseas, and what I see overseas and also here is there seems to be two economies. There's one economy that's doing very well technologically based, including even manufacturing that's technologically based. But then there's another sector of the economy where things, especially in rural areas, seem to really be in bad shape. And we look, of course, when we look at numbers, we're looking at overall numbers, so it kind of skews. Are you seeing that also, or am I, is it just a... No, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I, um, I, we don't spend, because I focus on the macro, there's only two of us, um, so we, can, we can't go into that kind of detail, but we certainly have seen that um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's endemic, I guess you could say, the problem in the U.S. And it, as you said, it's also in other countries as well. That's one, that's one reason why we're seeing increasing income inequality as well. I mean, that's also, you know, we had a moment uh, back in a couple of actions that were done by the U.S. government, I guess I'm thinking 2010, uh, with the fiscal cliff and some moves in terms of um, uh, some moves in terms of uh, something that done in terms of regulation and taxation had actually kind of modified some of the income concentration, but it's now gone back on the uplift. So yeah, I, I would say that I would talk to this gentleman over here. I think that would be a great um, seminar for this group because that I think is a it's it's an, it's an issue for the U.S. and it don't it doesn't seem to have a solution at this point. I'll do one more question and then we'll go to the rest of the slides. There's the, uh, you know, the continuing skills gap and given that the sort of level of percentage of Americans that have a college education and plus the ed ed that the immigration issues that are going on, how do you see that? Uh, that seems to be something that, that in no way is a positive trend. Uh, I was wondering just to comment on that. On the skills gap, well, actually, that kind of goes also in hand with this gentleman's point. Um, so what we, so we had done a piece in 2018 looking at um, the question of, uh, you know, everybody, everybody, there was a, during the election campaign in 2016, the argument was that everybody blamed trade. Trade was the reason why manufacturers, all these workers lost their jobs in manufacturing. It, they were, it was crushed. They were crushed. And, um, and part of that was the case. But according to the analysis done by a few folks from MIT and some other, um, some other um, I, uh, David Autor is the, I might be pronouncing his last name long, but he was pretty, he's one of the, I guess you could say, one of the leaders in this analysis, and a few others from MIT had done some work, and they found that, yes, jobs have been lost by manufacture, it, um, by trade, particularly when the, um, China joined the WTO, and so you started to see more ch cheaper Chinese products coming in to the U.S. competing with them, so, and also competing abroad as well. So you saw manufacturing jobs lost by trade, but according to these MIT professors, um, that made up one-seventh of the overall drop. And what made, the, what made up the other? Automation. Now at the point, now in a manufacturing site, in a factory, some places you, know, all you, you just need one person to turn on the lights. I'm exaggerating, of course, but there's a significant amount of automation in place in manufacturing. What you, need, what needed, what you needed for, uh, what, what was needed in terms of a, um, a project or a, or a work being done in terms of on the factory line you used to have five workers, now you only need one or maybe two. And the manufacturers now complain, not only do we not need five workers, we only need one or two, but those workers need to be more technologically literate, not necessarily like they have to go out and get their PhD or even a or even a bachelor's degree, but have a more technological literacy in, in terms of understanding how um, how the factory works. So that's where that's where the divide is. On um, so I kind of talked a little little bit. Again, back to the headwinds. Now, uh, you know, we we have been saying you know the U.S. and China have been passing, they continue to say, well, they're on again, off again. Um, and oh, I should actually add, all these con uh, headwinds that we're facing, it all comes when the, while this fiscal stimulus from the tax package, as well as the bipartisan budget agreement that were, in, that were put in place in, in um, late, you know, basically beginning in 2018, uh, I guess both were put in place in um, I guess the tax, patient, pa tax packages went into place at the beginning of 2018. Bipartisan budget agreement was a soon after. All these risks are coming while that fiscal stimulus from those two moves 
are fading out. They're, um, they're filtering out of the system. So what are we looking at? Trade tensions turning to trade war. I have a little bit more on that, but we had been skeptical uh, that the U.S. and China had reached any kind of agreement, uh, and we're still skeptical to this day. Um, policy risks in the U.S. Brexit, not a big impact on the U.S. Of course it is, if there was a no-deal Brexit, which seems less likely. But if there was, big, big, big hit for U.K. and, and also weighing on the, on the EU, a little bit on the, on the U.S., but it's still a concern. I don't think Iran um, has been talked about that much. But remember, Iran you know, almost, almost took out a significant oil, um, oil, um, oil um, uh, not factory, but an oil reserves in Iran, I'm sorry, um, in Saudi Arabia. That could have been a really big thing, and it was really luck that it didn't happen at all. And of course, Iran and the U.S. are still in dispute over, over, over issues about geopolitical risk. Those are concerns for the U.S. Domestic troubles, I think you know what I'm talking about, so I won't go into, I won't elaborate in that, but you can fill that in yourself. Um, these are policy risks that just add more to the, um, to the political, kind of the political um, uncertainty that businesses have to deal with when they're planning, when they're planning their investment actions. Now, I mentioned non-residential investment. It has slowed. Will it stall? I got some charts on that later on. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Core inflation moving closer to the Fed's 2%. Um, a lot of, um, we have seen, keep in mind, it's still low. Inflation in the U.S. is still low. But the CPI core, or um, Consumer Price Index core, which exclude food and, food and fuel, that is now at 2.4% year over year. The Fed's target is 2 Now, the Fed likes to look at what is called the financial um, personal consumption expenditures deflator, excluding food and fuel. That is below two, but not that far below. Yes, there is still uh, still cushion for the Fed to keep an easy, 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 um, easy path. But at 1.7, it's still getting a little close to that target rate. And also, the other surprise is that since the core CPI is so high, which one's going to give? Core CPI coming closer to the other one or vice versa. So that, I think, is one of the reasons why there are two Fed members that have dissented now three times at policy meetings. Don't take that lightly. A Fed dissent is very serious, and that means, and that's a real statement um, for that Fed member. The last thing I want to point out is the historically low participation rate. Those are long-term issues for the U.S., and why our long-term potential growth rate is now at 1.8 percent. That's not just S&P. That is something that the government, both the C many, many, uh, the basically government and the C uh, Congressional Budget Office, as well as Social Security um, Trust, has as their estimate for long-term growth potential. To put it in perspective, 10 years ago, it was closer to 3 percent. And why is it that um, long-term growth is so low for the U.S.? Why? Because of demographics, because of dem uh, because of aging, um, the reasons why it comes all down to productivity growth lost or slowed down because of dem because of baby boomers retiring from the workforce. That's one big factor, and a big chunk of that lost productivity that the U.S. is facing. But the other thing, the other reason that also explains why we're seeing slow growth. Remember, I talked about those manufacturers, those workers who worked in manufacturing. A lot of those, even today, were prime age workers, people who have families to feed, families to feed, um, children to take care of, and also spills to pay. They're, they haven't been, many haven't been working for some time. That's lost income to them, to, to their spending, and that's also lost, pro, lo, lost productivity for the U.S. Now, looking at this chart, what, uh, this chart, what is this saying? It's trying to break down the demographic effect on on uh, the economy. And when, I, when we say that um, growth is slow and why productivity, productivity is so, so slow tied to demographics, one thing that we look at is the US, the US labor participation rate. That's that red line. That's the actual, um, actual figure for labor participation rate in the US. It's near a 40-year low. A big reason is because of retirees, baby boomers, re uh, starting to retire, which are not done retiring. But what we wanted to see is what about all those people of prime age who left the work workforce? Those people who maybe they could, but maybe, but m for the most part, I expect most probably are struggling and couldn't find a job and just quit looking. 
those are what we found is many of those are people of working age and particularly prime age males, uh, 24 to 55, who'd lost, who, who've dropped out of the workforce dramatically since the 1980s. So what we're looking at here is what we tried to do at, um, at the company or at my team is try and break out the age structure effect. How much is tied to retirees and how much is tied to younger workers? The age structure effect probably explains about 75% of the overall drop in the labor participation participation rate. But the other, the other factor, the other gap, and if you look at this, this is just the age effect. These are just retirees. This is just my mom and dad who said, you know what, I'm done. I think I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go, you know, they moved to Florida. But it's the other, and that's understood. That's what you'd expect. But it's this, the other effect. Those other workers who left the workforce, why did they leave? That, to me, we call those the, the two million missing workers that explain the other gap. We think those are people that could be young, young kids who could be working but went back to school, probably because the recession was so, so, so severe. But we've also found people of prime age. I mentioned males, 28 to 54. That labor, their labor participation dropped significantly since 1980. And I'd also like to point women of prime age have also dropped out significantly or have, or have slowed, maybe not as much, but have also slowed. What does this mean for, for their income, for their household, and for the U.S. economy going forward? Now, other worries that we have. Business sentiment. You talked about manufacturing, one of the, one of the worries in manufacturing. Well, they are worried today, and they have good reason to be worried. They have good reason to be worried. Um, the headwinds from from the from the trade dispute that weighs on them, uh, the um, and that weighs on their clients. When you think about it, here you're looking at business sentiment and um, and business sent, um, sentiment on employment options going forward. The blue the blue lines are tied to ISM manufacturing sentiment readings. Both are in are in contraction territory. According to the ISM, ISM you'd like to. Below 50 is contraction territory. Manufacturing sentiment fell in contraction territory a few months ago, and it remains there. And we've also seen that manufacturing subcomponent of jobs, which is a very good predictor of future job hires or, or job losses, is also under 50 as well, signaling job cuts down the road. Now, we have seen that services, ISM services, the red and yellow lines, one is one, the, uh, the red line is the jobs sub-index, and the yellow line is the overall service index. Those are going, still, going along still strongly. Uh, they're both above 50%. That makes sense. Keep in mind that the domestic economy is largely driven by services. It makes up about two-thirds of the overall economy. We were once manufacturing, we are no longer. Um, so we, that makes up a huge chunk of the overall economy. And services aren't necessarily affected by trade. A little bit, but not so much. So that suggests that the, US, the domestic economy is holding, you know, that's, that means that services are doing so well largely because the domestic economy is healthy. One worry we have, of course, is that could manufacturing, that ma manufacturing recession spread into the other sector. We, don't, we haven't seen it just yet, but it is a concern. How could it spread? Well, how could it spread? What if businesses cut, start to cut back further? Looking at this chart, this is looking at business investment. Um, and we have seen drops. It also explains why manufacturing might be pretty down. These, these are their clients. This make, these, these people buy their stuff. On the left-hand side is equipment spending in the black line and capital e capacity, capacity utilization on the red line. Usually, when capacity utilization reaches 70, um, 80% or gets close to that, that usually means businesses need to expand. They need to buy stuff. They need to invest. The gap is widening. Even though you're seeing capa capacity utilization holding up relatively high, Business investment has been taking, um, been going slower and slower down. This is thir three quarters now. We've seen business investment decline. On the flip side, that's that's private that's um, private construction. That's 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 that is compared with employment. So the blue line is employment. The, the I'm sorry, the dark blue line is employment, non-residential employment. The lighter blue line is basically non-residential construction. Usually, as you as you might be able to see, they track each other pretty well. You know, on and off, they track each other pretty well. And why is that? It kind of makes sense. Well, if there are more jobs, business, and if, people, if businesses are hiring, they need more office space to put them in. If there are more jobs with, with paychecks, people have money to spend. That means more business for business, more, more revenue for businesses. They might need to 
maybe open up more shops. So it does track each other relatively well. Now again, you're seeing a divide on that level. Our worry here is that businesses are seem to be shedding investment. They seem to be cutting back on investment. They have not cut back on hires. The worry, of course, uh, uh, cut, cut back on jobs. The worry, of course, is when they start to do that as well. What I keep an eye on, and you might want to if you follow this stuff, is that the jobs market is holding up relatively well. What I keep an eye on is what happens, what are the leading indicators of when that could turn. Two indicators that I look at are one is the work week. If you start to see the work week, the hours worked, start to, start to shrink, well, that usually means that, well, there's a lot of lack, there's a lot of slack in the, um, on businesses' rosters. They could get rid of a few. They could, they, and usually what that means, if we start to see the work week, work week slip, eventually businesses start to shed permanent jobs as well. The second thing I look at is basically temporary hires. Temporary hires have, um, usually what we see there is that businesses will first cut temporary hires because they haven't invested in human capital in those workers. They're usually, they're considered temporary. They start to shed jobs in terms of the temporary side. And once they do that, then they move to the permanent hire and permanent jobs as well. We ha those two are still holding up relatively well, but I keep an eye on those to see if there's any change. Um, I'm going to do a couple more slides, and I know, well, we're okay on time here. Um, I wanted to go into the other factor. Why are businesses not, in not investing? What we think, and one of the reasons why we think businesses have really cut, I'm going to go back to that slide for a second, why we think businesses are cutting back on investment, um, even though the domestic side at least is holding up relatively well, we think a lot of it is tied to the so-called uncertainty, uh, increased uncertainty. Trade disputes, we talked, we're talked. we going to talk about U.S. and China, but we also have the U.S. and EU, EU fighting over basically car tariffs. We still haven't resolved what's happening with Mexico and Canada in terms of USMCA. All that means increased uncertainty for businesses as they plan, that they try and plan their next steps going forward. Not to, not to add, not to, not to also mention political dysfunction also probably doesn't make that road very clear as they start to plan um, their spending and um, investment op 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 options going forward. We've seen businesses reluctant to spend. We already talked about some sentiment reading suggesting a pullback. Um, the worry here, of course, is they're cutting. They're cutting, they're cutting now, they're cutting costs, um, despite actually some incentive for, on tax, the tax incentives to encourage them otherwise. This would be called, in our mind, this would be called, um, this would highlight, in a sense, the secondary cost from the trade war, um, that so-called crisis of confidence effect. Um, usually what happens, because of the concerns and the worries over what, what to expect down the road, businesses shut their pocketbooks, basically supply chains, which has become, in this globally, um, this extremely global uh, market, um, starts to atrophy as businesses shut down. So far, um, so far hiring has, they, so far their hiring, our concern is will that end too. Um, in terms of the real U.S.-China issue, uh, we, what we have been saying uh, for a long time, it's not really about trade. Um, in terms of the U.S. Um, US deficit, what we see there, which we think will likely grow, as I mentioned at the um, that second line, we, ex we expect to see the fiscal and trade deficits widen further. And why are the reasons behind that? It's largely tied to lack of savings. Uh, the U.S., particularly the government, has a large debt on its hand and a large fiscal deficit. How do they pay for it? They have to go ask our, our, our friends from abroad to pay, to, uh, to, um, to, that we borrow from our friends, to, friends from abroad. When you start to see the current account grow so significantly, what, I'm sorry, the capital account grow, what you ultimately see is the flip side, the current account also grows or the deficit grows as well. When we see these bilateral tariffs with U.S. and China or you could say the um, steel and aluminum tariffs on, well, I guess at one point it was almost everyone, uh, we just see those as rearranging, rearranging the deficit. We don't see the deficit um, narrowing at all. Um, the tax cuts that are in place, that just made, that made for higher growth in the U.S. It just made the U.S. Um, de deficits worse because the higher growth also made a stronger dollar, which made stuff abroad even more attractive. That's why we say the twin deficits, twin deficits will likely widen further. And why we say it's really this U.S.-China issue is not necessarily about trade. We think it's about, we think it's about an economic issues, the economic dialogue that the U.S. and China has to deal with. 
Um, a lot of it is tied to technology in the end. Um, when you look at these um, factors that really haven't been addressed and why we thought the phase one wasn't going to amount to anything, have they really addressed um, reciprocal bilateral investment opportunities? I don't think so. Have they really addressed in China the le uh, having a level playing field for foreign, for foreign businesses um, to compete with domestic firms? Probably actually no. Um, in fact, I would say given the, the heightened um, protectionist policies on both sides and non-tariff barriers kicking in, China probably has even ramped up. Um, it's a protection of domestic firms at the expense of foreign firms. Intellectual property protection also hasn't been really addressed as well. What we're saying on this, uh, what we have been saying on this, is that the direct costs, um, direct costs, now assuming, and I suspect I'm right, that phase one isn't going to do anything. It, we saw it as more as PR than just action. Um, we think the direct cost from all the tariffs that are in place right now probably cut up to 45 basis points off of U.S. growth if it lasts for a year, which it seems like it is at this point in time. The indirect costs um, are even going to be worse. And the in, when I talk about indirect costs, I was talking about the crisis of confidence that caused businesses to cut, cut investments so sharply in that earlier chart. Um, so there, um, we had an estimate for these indirect costs, although it's very hard to get a good sense of how much, how big it is. Um, our estimate was kind of on the low side. So I'm gonna go to the Fed because they have many more economists than we do. There's only two US economists. Uh, they have like 100, so we'll just go with them. Uh, what they saw, a Fed study that was done about a month ago or two months ago, they saw that the uncertainty effect from these these trade this these trade um, disputes, probably could shave upward of about one percent off of growth for the U.S. if this lasts. Um, what are um, I'd also like to point out that everybody keeps talking about tariffs. We think it's the least important in the long run. We don't think it, we yes it hurts and it's certainly going to hurt our pocketbooks if phase one goes if 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 the tariffs that are going to kick in in December uh, go in those are going to hit largely consumer products so consumers are going to see it uh, when they spend at the mall or when they shop online but tariffs do hurt but we think it's the least important the the things that we want to focus on and which haven't been really addressed are these non-tariff barriers investment restrictions and export controls the U S has put a number on the on China and China is doing it vice versa. That's where the hit comes through. I would say in terms of investment restrictions and export controls, um, it basically means that these hits to businesses mean it's lost, uh, ultimately it's lost um, uh, possible strategic opportunities for businesses. It also forces, if when you think about the world in terms of global trade relies on supply chains, very efficient supply chains um, um, uh, um, across the world, because of these export and um, um, investment restrictions, as well as tariffs in play, they're rerouted. So now businesses, both the U.S. and abroad, have to take a, sec a second best option. Again, loss to productivity. In China in particular, I'd like to point out China, by these investment and ex export controls on Chinese businesses, that's a real squeeze to them in particular, because China still relies on ample amount of U.S. Techno technological advances. Um, that means that that could hurt Chinese productivity and slow their growth even worse, more than we are expecting. And that means the region could be hit as well as other countries abroad who do, who do business with China. On the flip side for the U.S., U.S. had argued that this is going to bring business back to the U.S. You know, when we go, when we tighten our, our, our borders, going to bring business back and that means more jobs. We haven't seen it. In fact, probably the beneficiaries from this trade war with China is Vietnam, maybe Indonesia, and, and I believe Mexico as well. Uh, the last couple of charts I wanted to point out, I think I'm almost, and then we can have a, a good 10 minutes to discuss. Um, last couple of charts, can't leave out, um, can't, cannot leave out Uncle Sam. So, and believe it or not, this has to do with Uncle Sam. Um, looking at the, um, one of the things that we had said uh, when the tax package went in place, we thought there could be a near, we expected a near-term boost in terms of growth. We thought it would add cumulatively over a two-year period, so about 30 or 35 basis points of growth added to each year, 2018 and 2019, maybe a little bit in 2020. Um, but we didn't think it was, we thought it was going to cost more. Um, indeed, we weren't um, too far, far off. Uh, the congressional, but I think the, um, uh, the committee on, um, 
uh, uh, the Congressional Budget Office with the Joint Taxation uh, Joint Committee on Taxation found that the tax package probably cost the U.S. government uh, probably shaved off about or added about 20, 40 basis points to the fiscal deficit. I think their figure at the time, it might have changed, was about it cost the government about $1.5 trillion. It probably has changed, so don't you know check that number, but it did, it did in their mind, it added to, added to uh, the fiscal deficit. Uh, the Congressional um, re, uh, Research Services also agreed with what we saw was that the impact on growth was very minimal. I think they had maybe 20 basis points added to growth over those, over those, over, over those couple years. And why is that? Why were we not surprised? Why did we not see the productivity boost that was promised by the administration? Because a lot of those, a lot of those tax um, tax uh, benefits went back into um, scups, um, didn't go into necessarily investments, but went into share buybacks instead. Here, just to take a look, at this point right here, this is in, this this right here is the end of 2017. These are, and then that bump right up is the end of 2018. That, um, that figure, um, this is based on just our S&P 500 companies. So this is looking at our S&P 500 companies. It doubled. And so that's, um, and that's one thing I wanted to point out in terms of wh why we might not have seen that productivity boost. So if we didn't see the productivity boost, and if we do, and if, uh, Uncle Sam does have a big bill, adding another 1.5 trillion possibly to, to um, its uh, debt and its deficit, um, how do we pay for this? If you look at this chart, this is for 2018. One of the worries we have is that where do you find the money? Looking at health care and Social Security, that already in 2018 already made up over 50 percent of the budget. And according to the CBO, it's going to widen to about two, I think over two thirds in a decade or two. I don't remember exactly how long, but it's at least a decade. So it's going to widen because there's no, no solutions in terms of managing both Social Security and Medicare. That's the health care aspect. Those, those mandatory benefits. Other mandatory, that's actually um, benefits for veterans of, of of, um, of defense. That also won't be touched. So how do we get the money? Non-defense? Probably not. That's been squeezed to the bone. Defense, with all the problems we have, um, you know, that you, you read in the headlines, hard to see that having an impact. So the question is, how are we going to resolve this? Our estimate, fiscal estimate, we're saying it's probably going to reach about 1.2 before, um, before, by 2020. I, I'll stop here and Guard that question because I think your hand was up a few times. Yeah. My question: I remember across, um, in the '90s we got to a budget surplus when people said we would never get a budget surplus. Do you ever foresee us ever going back to what it was in the late '90s when the U.S. government was in was in black budget surplus? Yeah, that that came. There was basically um, almost two decades of of strength. I mean, those like what is that called? The Great um, uh, it was called something. <laughs> Two year, two decades of incredibly, relatively, very strong growth, 80s and 90s. There were recessions, but they were short and sweet and over quickly. Uh, then you had, um, then you had. Right now, what we're going through is partly we're going through a kind of a demographic change too. I mentioned the baby boomers retiring. Well, the baby boomers are retiring, and that feeds right into these mandatory, uh, basically, retirement retirement um, benefits that are at play. So that's also why, why that's widening further. Um, I would say what happened and why it turned around was basically, I think it was the, um, the tax package. Ta tax package, I think, under George W. Bush. I think that's one of the factors that actually, but again, I'm not a tax specialist um, in play there. Uh, could we see it turn around? I guess the only thing I can say is that, that quote, Winston Churchill, who said that um, the U.S. will come to the right decision after they exhaust every other possibility. So that's probably where we are. Yes, I think we will resolve it, but just the question is when. I should also be clear, I am not part of the sovereign ratings group, if you are wondering. Um, you can ask me what you want, and I'll just make something up. But I uh, just wanted to add that. Speaking oh, um, sure, go ahead. Um, you know, we're talking about baby boomers retiring, but we've also got an almost worldwide phenomenon of people having less babies. So we're not getting, you know, like, you know, one of the, I'm sure you're aware, of one of the main reasons we had such a boom in the American economy in the late 40s and the 50s was household formations. And it's just not happening anymore. And it's, you know, with the changes in, in family size, you know, it's not going to happen yeah. in most of the world. 
So you know, how do we adjust the economy to the fact that we're no longer going to have this population growth? It's um, so that would be another. Uh, you know, I, I think lawmakers have a have a lot of decisions to make, and unfortunately, at this point in time, it's so polarized. I can't see them coming even to the table to discuss things. I think those kinds of questions will be uh, will be ongoing. They're not going away. We know that you know we know that um, the uh, you know the 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 cost of um, the cost of health care for and social security uh, for retirees. I know um, baby boomers have been retiring. It's been it started I'd say several years ago, but it's not over yet. Add that to add another 10 years to that. So that means that's just going to balloon. As I mentioned, Social Security, um, uh, Congressional Budget Office sees health care and Social Security being two thirds of the budget in just 10 or so years. Add to that the question of basically um, having fewer births, you know, have few, uh, uh, birth rates are so low. So you do, that means you don't have the workers to be able to pay for these retirement benefits. I think the question, so to your point, to go to how this will be addressed, it's going to take a long time. I just don't know when. You know, it's, it's a, I know, I don't remember. You, I think you put yours up. Back to the income inequality question, which I think connects with some of the 2 million missing workers because men in the 40, 50 age range are seeing life isn't what they thought it would be. It's not better than their parents were. Um, so income inequality is an important thing. Opioid use is cutting the life expectancy of those people. In terms of their, the idea that, you know, the comment I think you made was there are no solutions. Um, there are at least three political solutions that are being made. One is Andrew Yang's, which is the basic income type thing. And then the other two are made by Warren and Sanders about significant taxes on high, very high income people or high, very high wealth people. Um, which of those, and, and recycling the money into education and childcare in the latter two, which of those might be better or less bad from an economic point of view? Basic income or very high taxes on very high income people or wealth taxes? I mean, this is, I'm going to say this from a personal position. So again, I'm not an expert on these. In fact, I think you know, basically the policymakers are still struggling to figure a lot of this stuff. So this would be from a personal position. Um, I thought it was an interesting um, position for Warren in terms of a small tax on wealth. Again, from just from a personal, personal position, I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I, I did think it was interesting. Um, I do have to say, my husband's a lawyer, and uh, he he, not, he and he read he reads law reviews and all that stuff. And one thing he said was that. Uh, there is a problem with that uh, constitutionally, even though it sounds interesting, and I, I thought it was an interesting, you know, interesting idea that there might be some options there. There might be a, a little bit, maybe it'll change, but there was, a, you know, possibly some some solutions in that embedded in that. Um, I under, from what I understood, the Constitution has rules in terms of um, basically blank. There, are, from what I understood, and again, you'll have to look this up because I wouldn't, I would be. I'm remiss to talk about something and say that I understand it completely. But from what I understood, uh, the Constitution um, um, kind of bars a lot of that action in terms of taxation on wealth. It was very hard for the constant for the U.S. government back in the 1700s, 1800s, to uh, get a uh, personal income tax. And so the um, the Warren administration, if indeed you know Elizabeth Warren does become president, will have uh, a lot of struggles on that. You know, maybe she'll change Basic it. Basic income because you'd be moving money from upper income people where there's a low marginal propensity to spend <coughs> to low income people <coughs> who'll spend the money. That, that help. Well, let's say let's say if that was something, whether it's I mean, I've understood talking about living wages, um, you know, is one other option on that. Uh, the uh, there's a there's a question of you know it's a lot of that would be. It's a, it's a subsidy. It's a, you know, and in some ways you consider you can see it as a subsidy to uh, lower income households and a tax on higher income households. 
that's been done in different ways. It has a different name for this, but that's something that could be done. I, um, the one thing, so, and what you're saying is correct, is that if money went into lower income households who have a much higher uh, marginal propensity to spend than low, then I'm sorry, lower income households who have a much higher propen uh, marginal propensity to spend than higher income households who get the money and then save it, that could be a boost to growth, certainly, and it certainly would help their, those households as well. Uh, there are questions about incentives too, though. That's one thing that um, would have to be a fact, would be fact, have to be factored in. Okay, one more, and then I'll finish these. I've got two more, but go ahead. So. Given that uh, the S and P and Dow have been in, uh, have been slowly reaching all time new highs in the tech sector, has recently hit uh, the highest growth in the last decade in terms of year to date so far. Uh, in the event that a, chi a U.S. China trade deal does go through and it's entirely vapid and it doesn't solve any of those three predicaments that you previously mentioned. What do you expect or predict market reactions to be? Uh, would there just be just joyous occasion that the fact the deal went through, or would there be more, far more scrutiny in the fact that an actual resolution was not reached? So if they, so we we had said a couple of times that what are the possible avenues to find whether it's a near term, long term, or you know no solution. So there was one which was throw money at the problem. That's sort of what what you're describing. That would be a short ter short term solution. I. How would markets respond? I, sus I suspect near term it would be that uncertainty would be it would be uncertainty relief. So there might be a, a you know it might be a boost to to markets because of that. But the long term issues would still remain the fight over who you know the fight over who leads in terms of the technological um, you know basically the fourth industrial revolution, which is technological change. Uh, that fight would still be ongoing. You still wouldn't have any. You if if it's the case, it's just throwing money at it, buying China buying more soybeans, for example, U.S. opening up a little bit, uh, allowing China to maybe um, invest a little bit in in Chinese business um, in U.S. businesses. Uh, I would say that um, I would say or U.S. just pulling back on tariffs because I don't think you, um, China would allow China um, U.S. would allow China to invest in U.S. businesses. I think that would still be tight. The three issues that I had mentioned before: one is level, level playing field in terms of level playing field between domestic and foreign uh, foreign uh, companies, uh, a reciprocal bilateral trade um, investment opportunities, and protection for int intellectual property. If those weren't addressed, we'll just be back at the drawing board and back in the negotiating table in a few years. I would see that as just a throwing money at the problem. My worry, of course, is will stubbornness win the day and then everybody goes down. Um, we have a few more minutes. I did have one more slide, but I don't really, this is my slide. I can talk about it later, but you can go, you can ask one more question. Yeah, just going back to the um, headwinds you talked about policy risks, what you did mention, uh, unless this is covered under domestic issues, is the election of 2020. And what impact does that election and the uncertainty of who will be our next president play in the whole economic outlook? Uh, that, I mean, that's, uh, right now it's hard to know who's actually in the, you know, on the Democratic side. I have to say there was one funny, um, it was an NPR uh, podcast and they were playing um, Lionel, Rich, 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 uh, Lionel Richie song, you know, hello. Something, is it me you're looking for? That song. And it was to announce the two new Democratic candidates. And I thought, oh, God, that was so funny. <laughs> I thought that was pretty, pretty, pretty funny. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I would say, I, I guess I, we don't know who's going to elect, you know, who's going to go into, who's going to be elected at this point in time. Usually the incumbent has more of an advantage, but we know that President Trump has a lot of handicaps at this point in time. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, in terms of the, what I see is the worry, regardless of who, well, depends on who wins, is the polarization of the U.S. country. That uh, the, the, the political dynamics are, are toxic. And what that means is things don't get done. When you talk about, we talk about some of the big issues, like a shutdown that I guess to, today would have been, it was Thursday would have been. I, I, the U.S. is actually dealing with con continuing resolution. I think it's a, as of Friday. It, it's not getting much attention, so I suspect it'll be blown over. But shutdowns just add more uncertainty for businesses' um, ec um, economic roadmap. Uh, and when we just talk about, we hear about all the stuff in the news that caused so, so many headlines, but keep in mind, even, even when you know, there's no crises on Capitol Hill, bills don't get signed. 
You know, I, um, I think it's Pew Research had showed in terms of the number of bills that have been signed into law um, since probably actually into um, um, back to probably a good part of the Obama administration. Nothing gets signed into law. That means things don't get done. Businesses don't have, you know, regulation or, you know, or changes and that could be positive for them. So that is a, that's going to be a problem. I don't think I, I think into 2020 um, how much will change, you know, if I if I, I see it as again, I'm not a political pundit, but I just see it as it's hard to see a change in this uh, unfortunately toxic environment. It doesn't seem like it's going to change even in 2020. That's a personal opinion, but and I hope I'm wrong. So I can stop. Well, we got, it is seven o'clock. Um, I'll just mention this last slide um, just so because it's up. Um, I just wanted to say this is just taught looking at, you know, I'm sure you've talked about the corporate debt, um, that the levels of corporate debt that we're looking at. Um, this is something that we do a comparison. We do sort of a, a, a vulnerability index for a non non-financial corporate debt. We also do it for household debt. Households balance sheets are looking rather relatively healthy. Um, uh, and that's a positive, but non-financial corporate debt, um, as we see it, that's the blue line. Uh, it's called what we do, it's called a principal components analysis where it takes um, data from various components and put it um, and basically structures it so that it goes into one read, one read of all those, uh, all those readings. And what you're seeing in that blue line, above zero means that there's more vulnerability, below zero means that there's less. Now that it's, a, it's been above zero and it's actually around that one point mark, one point means one, sta sta one standard deviation from the historical norm, suggesting that financial vul vulnerability has increased and that's a worry going forward. Um, I do wanna say that it's not, this doesn't necessarily cause recessions, but it makes it worse if there is one. What a way to end the evening. Um, <laughs> I can stop there. Um, it was great to be here, and thanks Thank for having me. Much.